now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. 7.06 here on a very busy Tuesday morning. Thanks for tuning in here to O'Connor and Company. Coming up at 7.35, Hung Kao, who is running for the Senate in Virginia. He's also a retired Navy combat veteran and worked in the explosive ordinance, uh, explosive disposal ordinance uh, division there. So he's got some experience with underwater uh, operations, uh, rescue and the like that we're seeing up in Baltimore Harbor uh, right now. At 8.05, Andy McCarthy will join us. And at 8.35, Jenny Terror. And, of course, we'll continue to deliver you as much information as we can as it develops and breaks over this catastrophic bridge co- collapse up in Baltimore that occurred overnight around one thirty in the morning. It's Larry O'Connor with Julie Gunlock. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Joining us right now is the president of Young America's Foundation and the former governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker. Governor Walker, always good to speak with you. Thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. Good to be with you. Well, and you know, when you run for governor, there's a lot of things that you want to accomplish. You want to be able to obviously uh, uh, protect law and order and justice in a state. Uh, but also, of course, when you became governor in Wisconsin, your main focus was on budgets, was on um, getting spending down, uh, stopping the stranglehold of public employee unions. And then something will happen, an event like this, and suddenly the governor's main focus is a disaster like what's going on right now with Governor Westmore of Maryland up in Baltimore. Can you lend some some expertise on this, on what a governor has to do to sort of prepare for a moment like this? Yeah, and it's something you need to do right away. I remember um, even before I was elected, the year before, just talking about running for governor, we were a number of us together, and Jeb Bush, who at that point was a former governor of, of Florida, um, one of the best pieces of advice he said was, he said, uh, when you get ready for your transition, one of the most important things you're going to do, now, of course, his case, he came from a hurricane state, was put together an emergency team. It's not just a director, but, but your whole plan. Get that ready to go, because you may need to use that the very first day you take office. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do it right, nobody else will. will you know, that, that's what you're going to be judged by. Nothing else will matter at that point. The other important thing was being there. I remember talking as a governor, not only myself, but talking with other governors in both parties, when something tragic would happen, a lot of us would reach out to that individual, give them support, give them feedback from what we'd gone through. But you, you just got to be there. You got to see what's going on. You got to be on top of it. And you got to bring every resource to bear to make sure you're doing all that you can to take care of it. Of course, in this case, it's working with the city. It's working with federal officials. It's working. Whoop. Governor Walker, did we lose you? We did. We lost. We lost Governor Walker. We will try to reconnect with him in a moment. But yeah, that's it's it's funny. It's like nobody ever runs on that. Nobody ever runs. I want to be your governor, so I'm going to be the point person to handle yeah. any sort of natural disaster or yeah, riot but what, or whatever. That but, advice but, that he just gave. You know, I used to work mm-hmm. at the American Red Cross, and I did actually disaster work uh, for a couple years, uh, way before kids. But mm-hmm. that is excellent advice. What he said is, you know, don't wait for the, for a disaster to happen. Right. Uh, to put together a team, it is really important that you have people in place. We reconnected oh, with. Good. We've reconnected with Governor Walker. Sorry about that, Julie. Thank you. And um, Governor, if I could turn your attention to something that I know that you feel very strongly about, it. of course, as president of Young America's Foundation, your organization and you personally, you're on college campuses, high school campuses, and now Young America's Foundation has begun programs at the middle school, junior high level, which I think is brilliant. And thank you for that. And you've seen firsthand exactly how not just social media, but specifically TikTok changes not just what these kids are focused on and talking about, but in a way, how they talk about it. I mean, you you see how quickly they adopt these these patterns of speech and behavior and talking points that they learn deliberately from the Chinese Communist Party. Well, that's just it. I mean, I get people saying, okay, free speech, and I'm all for free speech. But this is different. Than, you know, the things on uh, on X uh, when it was Twitter before uh, Elon Musk took it over that I was upset about their things. I don't like necessarily on on uh, different versions of Meta, be it Facebook or Instagram or others out there. It's not about being just being concerned about what's on or the contents that's on. Uh, but this is, as you mentioned, directly driven by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, one of our alumni, one of our board members, Peter Schweitzer, he's got an exceptionally good book that came out yeah. last month, yes. Blood Money, talks exactly about this, that, that China's whole 
uh, targeted effort, be it 2,000 some Chinese nationalists on the side of the border, being it you know, providing built, uh, pill presses at cost to the drug cartel, uh, but, but also he talks about TikTok and a whole assortment of other things that they're doing. TikTok is not the same in China as it is in the United States. There's a concerted effort focused on this. And if you're having something that's collecting information, that's pushing propaganda, uh, people say, well, so what? I said, well, we wouldn't, during World War II, we wouldn't let Germany run uh, the three major networks at that time uh, because we didn't want the airways filled with propaganda. And that's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. And what, what do you say to people, though, who, who because there are people that I respect on the other side who really do worry that this is sort of a slippery slope and that, um, you know, it is a attack on, on free speech and, and that we the government shouldn't be sort of dictating these things. How, how do you respond to those charges that this could be a sort of quell free speech in America? Yeah. Well, I certainly don't dismiss it because I think it's good for us to be vigilant in that regard as well. But that's where I distinguish between the, the two is we're not we're not asking the government to regulate. I certainly don't want the federal government to regulate speech out there. Uh, we don't want to have some board or council or commission that's in there regulating it. But in this case, I think the legislation that's being uh, – that the House passed, that the Senate's at least considering taking up, uh, is is the right approach, which is saying – CCP, we got to have the foreign interest out of this. If somebody else wants to buy into the interest, they still want to have TikTok. I don't have to like it. There's plenty of things I don't like, even if it's not run by the CCP. Uh, but don't have a foreign interest directly involved in it, particularly one that's specifically targeted the United States. And I think that's the case. You want to have it? Have it. It's not. Some people have talked about a ban. I certainly tell people I wouldn't be on TikTok personally. I don't have it on my phone. I don't want that information gathered for me. But as an organization, EF has set up a separate account. We, we're engaged in being on there because until um, I- until nobody's on it, we need to be there for the same reason we're at the University of California, Berkeley, or Harvard. Yeah. Places. Yeah. Uh, it's because that's where kids are at. Other, other bastions of Marxism and decay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because you got to go where the kids are. But i got to ask you, you know, this is, this is the tough thing about being a conservative and trying to reach out to young voters and school-aged voters is that you're trying to advance ideas and principles and, and overriding values that they may never have heard before, sadly, whether it's in their home or certainly in the public school system. And so you want to be able to explain to these kids why these values and principles are the right ones and ones that they should align themselves with now, yet at the same time not seeming like the square who's saying, get off my lawn. I mean, the initial reaction of kids when you mention that TikTok and other social media platforms are destructive, do they immediately recoil and say, hey, man, I enjoy this. Get get off my app. I like this sort of thing. You know, how do how do you sort of find the, the right balance there and still appeal to these voters? Well, I think that's where the key, again, with this current legislation is it's not banning it outright. It's it's saying who should have the controlling interest in it. Uh, I still think there's issues with it. I still warn people about it and say it might be nice, but you don't know exactly what's being uh, collected in regard. And obviously at a certain age, you just don't care, I guess, about that. Yeah. Uh, but in but in the end, it, it's you know it's kind of like uh, I've said this on your show several times since the 2022 election. There was all this talk of a red wave. It didn't happen. People said, well, why is that? You know, is it because of a specific issue? Is it because of specific candidates? Those things matter. They have an impact. But but I pointed out repeatedly, more than anything else, the data clearly shows it was 18 to 29 year old voters in in places like Pennsylvania, in Arizona, in yeah. Nevada, in Wisconsin, other battleground states. They went 30 points or more for the Democrat over the Republican candidate. Where you see the national polls shifting and why Joe Biden is in such trouble, even the New York Times poll showed a 16 point drop from 2020 to 2024 in younger voters. Um, I remember after the 2022 election, when I was pointing this out, people said, and some of them immediately said, well, you know, it sounds like you're afraid of younger voters. I said, I'm not. I'm not afraid of younger voters. I'm afraid of younger voters who only heard one side of the story. Yeah. And that's what we do at Young America's Foundation is making sure to the best of our ability that young people are hearing all sides of the story. Yeah, amen to that. We love YAF. We love Young America's Foundation. We love the work that you're doing. Uh, but, you know, I meet people, college-age kids or high school kids a lot because of my kids who are the same age. And, of course, yeah. when they find out what I do for a living, they say, oh, and then immediately the conversation turns to 
Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh, you know, <laughs> and yeah. and and they, they know about project. them first, oftentimes yeah. because of yeah, people forget this, but mm. Ben Ben before he became the superstar was a regular speaker for Yaf, and you were able to bring him to these campuses and raise that audience of of college kids that grew up listening to Ben. It's funny when we think about him having a few hundred people at the first couple. Uh, lecture series and now he's got you know thousands and thousands in person yeah. oftentimes when we have them on our, our youtube channel yf tv uh you, you literally have i remember one episode we had at unc uh greensburg uh we, greensburg we actually had 27 million people watch one of his clips so it does have amazing impact and it does get in their algorithms so as much as people said oh get away from big tech the fact of the matter is we can penetrate with the, we've got solid messages and we've got good ways to get to young people. We can penetrate uh, what otherwise has been impenetrable, but we, we've got to do it in formats that aren't feeding into the CCP. And I think that's where the yeah. distinction is. All right, Governor Scott Walker. Great work over there at YAF, YAF.org. Great YouTube channel, too. Check that out. Thank you, Governor. We've got to leave it there. WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live. From the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. Netanyahu cancels a diplomatic trip to the U.S. after Biden betrays him at the U.N. It's Biden restoring our standing in the world. 9 a.m. on WMAL. Yeah, I'll start with the last one. So I don't know how many vehicles yet. I know that we have detected the presence of vehicles. As far as the number between the 7 and 20, that's been a dynamic count um, throughout the morning, just given the fact that we haven't yet nailed that number down. We do believe that at least seven are involved in that, at least seven at this point. That fell into the water. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is a Baltimore rescue official earlier this hour. Uh, well, last hour, I should say, mid-hour, as they delivered as much information as they could about this catastrophic bridge collapse, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the uh, uh, the uh, continuous steel trust bridge over uh, Baltimore Harbor has collapsed after a cargo ship has collided into it. Uh, many of the questions that we've been asking throughout the dark of the early morning hours as all we had to work with was this video showing the collision and the collapse uh, are answered by this press conference. The other workers on the, the deck of the ship at this, or the deck of the bridge at this point, we had heard that information. Can you confirm that? We were being told there were workers on the bridge. We have yet to confirm that. Um, we'll work with MDTA to, to you know, obviously to get that information. About how many cars were on that ship, last question, uh, on the uh, on the deck of the bridge at the time it collapsed? Do you know Don't have a number. I can tell you our sonar has detected the presence of vehicles submerged in the water. I don't have a count of that yet. Thank you. And uh, like I said, uh, utilizing uh, drones and sonar, they determined anywhere between 7 and 20 vehicles. Uh, which, again, is rather miraculous considering uh, one thirty in the morning, usually there's, you're going to have more than that many vehicles on that bridge. Mm. Uh, also about the crew of the ship. Chief, can you tell us where the crew of the ship is? Um, you also mentioned, too, that uh, two people were rescued. Who made the first 911 call? And there were reports that it was a crew on the deck of the ship working at that point. Can you confirm any of that information? The latest information we have on the, sh on the crew of the ship is that they are still on board the ship. Um, there's been comms between the ship crew and the Coast Guard. So as, as part of the uh, overall operation, we communicate through the Coast Guard with the ship. And, and I'm sorry, your other questions? There were two people taken. Who made the first 911 call? I don't know who's who made that call yet. Okay, and there were... Uh, it is suffice to say it's a chaotic scene at the Patapsco River as now in the light of the sun they can see the e extent of this damage and the crumpled steel of mm. what had been the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, still more questions, but at least we're getting some of those answers now, and we'll give you more as it comes our way. It's 722. Making sense of your world. Something you just don't hear anywhere else. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 7.37 on this Tuesday morning in the nation's capital. Coming up at 8.05, Andy McCarthy will join us on the latest Trump legal news. Uh, somewhat positive day for the former president yesterday in court. 835, Jenny Terror 
for the New York Post, she captured that, well, now iconic video footage at the southern border of what can only be described as an invasion. We'll talk to Jenny about that. I'm Larry O'Connor alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Good morning, Julie. And it's been a very busy one as we balance our usual programming, uh, focusing on news, politics, and pop culture issues that affect everyone in our listening area, as well as this breaking story out of Baltimore, where overnight at 1.30 in the morning, a cargo ship uh, bound for Sri Lanka, a Singapore flagship, uh, apparently lost control, lost engine, lost power, still getting to the bottom of what happened to this ship. But it collided with a pylon holding up the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And as seen on a video that is now going to be seen, well, really for the rest of our lives, this amazing, unbelievable video footage shows that bridge collapsing. And now the rescue effort continues. The latest information that we have from officials in the area from the fire department is that they've identified up to between 7 and 20 vehicles in the water based on utilizing drones and sonar uh, uh, technology. And uh, so far, they're continuing that effort to try to rescue whoever happens to be in that cold water of the Patapsco River. So we'll give you more details as it develops. But thankfully, uh, we actually have a guest that kind of covers all of the bases for us today. Uh, He is running for Senate in Virginia, and I certainly want to talk about that race. But he's also a retired Navy combat veteran, retired as a Navy SEAL. He's a graduate of the Naval Academy. And Hung Kao, you know a little too, a little, a thing or two about getting in the water as a diver and doing really hard things under there. Uh, thanks for joining us today. No, thank you so, so much for having me, uh, Larry. And it's a sad day. And also, just real fast, I'm a, not a Navy SEAL. I'm a Navy EOD. Did and, I say uh, SEAL? Navy diver. I'm yes, so sir, sorry. I, did, I didn't mean no, to. Okay. I don't know if that's an upgrade or not for you, actually. I'll let, I'll let other people decide. Uh, but he was uh, involved with uh, explosive ordnance disposal, which is uh, honestly probably the toughest job in the Navy uh, or right up there. Uh, Hung, what's going on right now with this rescue effort based on your perspective, knowing the challenges of dealing with this kind of thing? Yes. So I'm sure the fire department and there's a Coast Guard station there. They have scuba divers that can go down. But this kind of salvage operation or actually rescue operation is very dangerous because you have a lot of twisted steel. You have metal and everything else. And you've got, I mean, the the current there is not very high. It's about 0.2 knots. And so it's not going to carry away a lot of the sediment once the the bridge collapses and kicks up all the silt. And so you won't be able to see anything. Mm. And so what we need to do is also shift uh, into salvage recovery also. So that's where you bring in the hard hat divers, the the surface applied, we wear the helmets, we wear a lot of chafing gear, and there's a, a, a you know umbilical that goes to the surface that gives you unlimited air. That's what you're going to need for this kind of long extended operation. So for people who actually did enter the water, I mean, there was the, you know, going into the water along with the bridge itself. Um, that's obviously incredibly dangerous and deadly. Um, but then the water temperature is is very cold. Uh, in these rescue situations, you know, from the time they launch the boats from the shore and get there, it, 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 it takes quite a long time to even get organized. How long can people really survive? I mean, you said they're not going to drift away. How long can people survive in that cold water? Oh, that's that's the problem, right? I mean, that's the cold water will will shut down a lot of, uh, you know, your your body's ability to fight off. But the, the one of the neat things, well, not neat, but when cold water hits your face, your body automatically stops uh, breathing. You actually, you know, I've done some ice diving. You have to force yourself to to breathe after that happens, mm. uh, because you know it's an automatic uh, uh, nervous system, uh, uh, you know, response to to shut down breathing. But it's just. It's just sad. I mean, we've got to really focus first on the the, uh, rescue, Mm -hmm. but also start looking at salvage, basically bringing in the heavy equipment, the hard hat divers. Like I said, we wear hot water suits so we can keep ourselves warm or dry suits just in those situations. If if I could turn this to politics for a moment, we have had a statement, by the way, in the last hour from the White House, obviously saying that they're in contact with the governor and the mayor and the Coast Guard's on the scene and uh, speaking anonymously a white house official said that there is no indication of any nefarious intent why that needs to be anonymous i'll never know but i gotta ask you hung Kao, that there is a feeling in this country that that things just aren't working <laughs> that, that they're from from airplane doors falling off to uh uh the train wrecks on a regular basis including of course the one in east palestine ohio 
Um, we have a, and now this incident, we have a Secretary of Transportation and Pete Buttigieg who spends more time talking about racial equity with regard to highways and about climate change than about just sort of focusing on the fundamentals of keeping our country and our infrastructure working. I was told by this president that passing this big spending bill was going to, you know, be a huge boost for our infrastructure. And we're looking at this like ships didn't used to crash into bridges, you know, Hong Kao. And this is sort of the feeling, I think, of voters. It's like we things are breaking and falling apart around us and we need competency back. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, those when, when they're going in and out of harbor, they have two pilots on board. So the pilots actually belong to the harbor. So they know the harbor inside and out. They should have had the. Uh, the anchor is ready to drop in case, you know, they're, they're claiming engine failure, then you should have dropped anchor right then and there yeah. so that you don't run into the bridge. But like you said, they're, they're so worried about other things, uh, you know, instead of infrastructure. What does the Port of, Har- uh, of Baltimore bring in? A lot of, you know, goods from other countries that we need. You know, right now we're so dependent on, on China. Like uh, one of my articles was about the personal protective equipment, like latex gloves that, that are coming in from China – we only make 2% here, and under Donald Trump, we had the Defense Production Act, which would have uh, – we, we built six factories down in southwest Virginia and, and Whitsville, and you know, uh, Joe Biden refused to upgrade uh, – update the uh, Defense yeah. Production Act, and so they have, don't have the money to build it. And this is stuff that touches Americans every day, from your meat packers to your you know, uh, uh, food service attendants to EMTs like my wife, first responders – and and even your surgeons. Hung Kao, can you stick with us? Because we, we sort of borrowed your expertise on this uh, search and rescue that's going on in the cold waters of the Patuxent River right now. But I, I would love to speak with you about the campaign and what you're trying to stress to differentiate yourself from uh, Tim Kaine and from the other candidates. Can you, can you do one more segment with us? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. That's Hung Kao. He's running for Senate in Virginia. We'll continue with him in a moment. <laughs> Hung Kao is our guest, retired Navy captain, now running for the United States Senate, hungforva.com. Hungforva.com is where you get all the information about the campaign. And, you know, I'm told by Jen Psaki that Virginians don't actually have to worry about the border crisis, Hung. But, you know, as a as a legitimate legal refugee from Vietnam back in 1975 when you came to this country with your family, uh, fleeing that regime. I, I find it of interest that, they, you know, they don't use the word refugee anymore. At the beginning, they say, well, these are these are people seeking asylum and they're refugees. They keep saying migrant as if they're here to, you know, pick strawberries or something. But what we're seeing right now is completely unprecedented. And Tim Kaine has been completely silent about it. Oh, actually, he, he's not silent. You heard yeah. on uh, Shannon Bream this weekend on uh, Fox News, he was saying, oh, no, it's not. It's irresponsible to call it uh, an invasion. And like, well, I've been down to the border, Tim. You know, like, I went down there. I saw what happened. I saw what happened down in uh, Yuma, Arizona with uh, Joni Ernst and uh, Chad Wolf. You know, we saw we saw exactly what happens down there. I mean, it's it's sad, and it, it's, you know, this is a, a tragedy that's happening to the United States. They're importing people in here. Now, uh, Tim Kaine has voted against the Lake and Riley Act, which would have yes. prohibited, you know, Don, uh, Joe Biden from – using federal funds to fly these guys in. So it's not enough that they walk in. Let's yeah. help them fly in also. You're right. It's worse than being silent. Yeah, and Tim <laughs> Kaine even went further. He said that y- using the word invasion was inciting violence. He said that on, on Fox News, as you mentioned. it was It's just nuts. Oh, you're right, uh, Julie. I mean, inciting violence, What what's more violent than overrunning the National Guard right. at the border? Exactly. And, and uh, I mean, if you talk about violence, what's happening in our, our own cities where it's you know heinous crimes, including sexual assaults on, on young women, and where are they when when this this is happening? And this is why I'm standing up here because you know what I came here legally, and and don't ask for the American dream if you're not willing to obey the American laws and embrace the American culture because I bled and fought for this country. Uh, Hung Kao, real fast, uh, you're in a crowded field right now for the nomination, but that's not new to you. You did the same thing uh, two years ago in the 10th Congressional District, and you prevailed as the nominee there. When you go out and campaign, what is it you're hearing from Republican voters who will decide who the nominee is? What is their chief concern right now, and what do they want from I their think next senator? The biggest thing is, is the fact that the border is the biggest issue in America right now. In, in Virginia and and across the nation, and they just want somebody to, to 
to step up and say, no, enough is enough. Let's finish this border wall system. It's not just a wall. It's a wall system that, you know, it's, it includes concrete that goes into the pipes, the metal pipes. Mm-hmm. It includes fiber optic cables that allows us to have monitoring equipment like uh, EOIR sensors or seismic sensors. That's what we need right now. And that's what Americans need. And you know what? We, we've got, I mean, I've amassed $2 million in, in the last eight months from over 20 something thousand uh, donors, you know, let me just do the Asian master you roll fast. It's $88 per person. That's, that's how they're, <laughs> that's, that's how they are. They are, they're, they're speaking. They're speaking with their wallets saying, this is what we want. We want somebody that's going to stand up and fight for us. I had no idea you were a math major in Annapolis. <laughs> that's impressive. I'm glad he did the say. math for us. Mm. <laughs> Hung Kao, always good to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Good luck uh, the rest of the campaign. Primary's coming up soon. I'm sure we'll touch base again.